Let's turn now in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 3 as we continue our study through the Bible. We are told that there was a long conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. This is after the death of Saul. The son of Saul, Ishbosheth, has been established as king over Israel. He is reigning from Transjordan. He has moved across the Jordan over into the area of Gibeah and established there his throne, ruling over the northern kingdom. But the tribe of Judah has made David the king over Judah. So you have actually a divided kingdom. David ruling over Judah in the south and the son of Saul, Ishbosheth, ruling over Israel in the north. And there was this rivalry, conflict, but David continued to increase in strength. He waxed stronger and stronger. The house of Saul, weaker and weaker. Ishbosheth was not at all a strong ruler. Uh, Abner, his general, was uh, more the authority and the power behind the throne. Ishbosheth was sort of a puppet type of a ruler. The power behind the throne belonged to Abner. Now, while David was there in Hebron, and he reigned in Hebron for seven years, before moving to Jerusalem and moving the capital and his throne to Jerusalem, he reigned for seven years in Hebron. There he began a practice that was against the law of God. A practice that was taken up by his son Solomon and um, taken totally out of proportion. David began to gather together a multiplicity of wives. And he is now beginning to bear many children. During this period in Hebron, unto David were sons born. The firstborn was Amnon, of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, Amnon met a very tragic fate. He was murdered by his stepbrother or half-brother Absalom. Uh, the different wives with different children created, as you can well imagine, all kinds of problems. Talk about sibling rivalry. Uh, it really magnifies and intensifies when you have different mothers. Uh, even with the uh, sibling rivalry with the same mother and father can be fierce, but you get different mothers, and it is extremely fierce. Amnon, the firstborn, was slain by uh, Absalom. His second was Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. The third was Absalom, the son of Makkah. Chiliab we know nothing about. He evidently died early. He doesn't figure in the future story at all. The fourth was Adonijah, the son of Haggith. Uh, Adonijah, at the death of David, was the oldest son then alive. By then, Absalom was already dead. Amnon was dead, and Adonijah was the oldest son alive, and so Adonijah attempted to take the throne at the death of David. However, Solomon came into power, and Adonijah submitted unto Solomon, and Solomon uh, offered him a uh, amnesty from his endeavors to overthrow him. And as long as he behaved himself, he could continue. But Adonijah came to Solomon, later on requested the 
uh, one of the concubines of David, and as a result, uh, Solomon had him put to death. Um, so it names the sons and the different wives that David picked up in Hebron. This is just the beginning. As he moves later to Jerusalem, he adds to the number. In the 17th chapter of Deuteronomy, the Lord in the law anticipating and of course knowing in advance the things that would transpire in the nation said, and when you have come into the land and you're prospering and you have set up a king over you. So God anticipates the time when they would reject his ruling over them and would uh, seek a monarchy. When this happens, the Lord gave orders to the king. The first being, he is not to multiply unto himself wives. Now this is what David is doing. It's in direct uh, disobedience to the law of God. As I said, his son Solomon carried it to an extreme. His son Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And uh, we are told that the wives became his downfall. Uh, and I'm not surprised. Uh, they turned his heart after other gods. Now, it was the common practice among the heathen for the rulers to take many wives. Usually, treaties were effected between nations by a king sending his daughter to become a part of the uh, wives of another king, the part of the harem so that you have peace with this king because actually you're married to his daughter. And that's the way treaties were often uh, developed in those days is by the king sending a daughter to become a wife. And many of David's wives were actually the daughters of the kings of the nations round about who wanted to establish more or less a treaty with the nation of Israel. Uh, this is a fault of David. It is against the law of God. Uh, the one thing about the Bible is its total honesty. It doesn't seek to gloss over the sins of the heroes. And David was certainly a hero in the scriptures, but he was also a sinful man. He did things contrary to the law of God. He made his mistakes. I believe the reason why the Bible does give to us the weaknesses of the heroes is that we do not get into a worship of the heroes, first of all. Secondly, it is to encourage us who are also guilty of weaknesses and violating the laws of God. We who are also imperfect, it encourages us because we realize that God uses imperfect people to do His work. Somehow in our minds we have developed a concept that is false, that God can only use perfect instruments. And if you're not perfect, then you are disqualified from God's service. But if God used only perfect people to do His work, He would be without any workers. <laughs> there is none righteous, the Bible says, no, not one. And yet, isn't it interesting how that we are always shocked and amazed when we hear of the imperfections of God's servants? Oh, how could he, you know? And we're always so shocked and disappointed when we find out that they're not perfect, that they have their flaws, and that they have their faults. It's to keep your eyes off of men and keep your eyes upon our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Men will disappoint you. Men will fail. But Jesus will never disappoint you. He will never fail. And if you keep your eyes on him, you'll be all right. If you get your eyes upon some man, some ministry, then you are going to see things that are going to stumble you. So keep your eyes upon the Lord. Now that's not to excuse the ministry. It's not to say that it's okay to be flawed. It's not okay to be flawed. Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the scripture does challenge us to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And we should be examples unto the believers, or what a believer is, to the world. And there is not the attempt of excusing the weaknesses. But notice, God exposed the weaknesses. And this is good. It needs to be exposed. When there is a flaw, a weakness, it should be exposed. David was flawed. He took many wives. Some feel that this was sort of a on the bounce kind of a thing. When he fled from Saul, Saul took his wife, Michelle, and gave her to another man. It is quite possible that David did love Michelle and that he was hurt when she was given by Saul to another man and so to assuage his grief he took on all of these different wives. I have a little difficulty buying that. Uh, as we will get into the text next week we will find that he had some real problems with Michelle as time went on and uh, greatly disgraced her. Now, this was happening with David in Hebron in this period of seven years that he was there. Meanwhile, back in the northern kingdom where Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was reigning, there was a concubine of his father whose name was Rispa. And he said to Abner, his general, Why have you gone in to my father's concubine? And Abner was very angry for the words of Ishbosheth, and he said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul, your father? and to his brethren, and to his friends? Did I not deliver unto you the hand of David that you charge me this day with a fault concerning this woman? And so this problem evolved. Now, the scripture doesn't uh, indicate whether or not it was a false or a true charge. It could have been a true charge that he had actually gone in and is now being rebuked by Ishbosheth. It was a common practice for the new king that came in to take into his harem the concubines of the previous king. And that was more or less the sign of his authority and of his reigning. We mentioned earlier Adonijah asked Solomon that he might have one of the concubines of David and this was such a breach of etiquette that Adonijah was put to death by Solomon. When Absalom rebelled against David and David fled out of the city of Jerusalem, Absalom took the concubines of David 
and went in unto them before the people, uh, which was the declaring of his ascension to the throne. So it could be a true charge that Amner did go into this concubine, which would have then been a sign that he of his power and authority and Ishbosheth is rebuking him for it, but actually Abner says, Hey man, I'm the one that set you up. Who do you think you are rebuking me? And it created a tremendous schism. And so he said, God do so to Abner and more also, except that the Lord has sworn, as the Lord has sworn to David, even so do I. So he acknowledged his allegiance at that time to David. God has sworn that David is going to be the king and I join with him. I, I'm going to throw my lot in with David to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. So having set Ithbasheth on the throne, he now deserts him and he turns to bring Israel, all of Israel, under David's reign. He could not answer Abner a word because he feared him. The power was in the military and uh, the king was just sort of a vassal king and he was afraid of Abner. And so Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying, Whose is the land? Make a league with me and behold my hand will be with you to bring all of Israel unto you. And David said, Good. I will make a league with you, but one thing I require, and that is, you will not see my face unless you bring Michelle, the daughter of Saul, who I married and paid the dowry for, and uh, you're not going to see my face unless you bring her. So Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Faltiel, the son of Lesh, and her husband went with her along the way, weeping behind her to Bihurim. Uh, it's sort of a tragic and pathetic sight. Now, David didn't need Michelle, certainly. He had married all these other women. It was, a, uh, again, I think a fault and a flaw of David. She had been given to this other man. Of course, that was a fault, too. But uh, two wrongs don't make a right. And... Uh, this other fellow evidently did love her. He walked along weeping all the way until they came to the Jordan River. And then Abner, who was bringing Michelle, said, Okay, guy, that's enough. Go home. And so he had to uh, go back home, and Abner brought Michelle, uh, or Michelle to David. And so... Abner had communication, verse 17, with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David in times past to be the king over you. Now is the time to do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, out of the hand of all their enemies. So Abner also spake in the ears of Benjamin, that is the tribe of Benjamin, and Abner went also to speak to the ears of David in Hebron, and all that seemed good to Israel, and it seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. So uh, Ishbosheth, being a weak king, was not able really to defend the nation against the Philistines. David, in the meanwhile, was growing stronger and stronger in Hebron. The tribe of Judah was dwelling safely. The other tribes were still being invaded by the Philistines because of the weakness of Ishbosheth. And so when Abner says, Look, let's join with David, make him the king. They all pretty well consented to it. And so they came, 20 of them, with uh, Abner, no doubt the leaders of the other tribes, to inaugurate David as the, uh, or to acknowledge this uh, kingdom to be passed to David. So Abner came to David, to Hebron, 20 men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a great feast. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my Lord the King. And they will make a league with you that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent him away in peace. 
Now, Joab, in the meantime, who had had this fight with Abner, and in the battle with Abner, Abner has killed Joab's younger brother. Joab had this feeling of revenge against Abner. At the time that Abner came down, Joab was gone. Perhaps had been sent by David on a foray as they went out against the Amalekites and uh, took great spoil. And they'd been gone in the battle and they were coming back with the spoil. And when they returned back from pursuing after the Amalekites, bringing a great spoil with them, Abner had already left David and had gone in peace. And when Joab and his men came, he was informed that Abner had been there and that David had received him and sent him away in peace. So Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? I hear that Abner came to you and you sent him away and he's quite gone. Don't you know that he came to deceive you? He was a spy. He just came to check out the situation in order that he might invade you. He just observed, you know, the weak points, the strengths. And, you know, he doesn't intend to turn the kingdom over to you. And so Joab went out and he sent men to tell Abner to come back as though David wanted to discuss further the arrangements. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab met him in the gate and took him inside the guardroom of the gate and put his sword under his fifth rib or ran him through the heart. And he killed him for his brother Asahel, who was killed by Abner. Now, you remember they had um, the avenge type of killings. It's something that is the real problem in Lebanon today are these uh, avenge killings. Uh, they still practice that. Uh, if you kill one of my family, then, you know my sons will kill one from your family as, as a revenge kind of a killing. And Joab's brother being killed by Abner, then Joab took it upon himself to kill Abner in revenge for his brother. And so it, it says here that uh, he smote him, that he died for the blood of Asahel. And afterward, when David heard of it, David was upset. He was hurt. And he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. And so he totally washed his hands of the incident and uh, claimed his innocence. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all of his father's house. Of Joab, let there not fail from the house of Joab one that has an issue or that is a leper or that leans on a staff or that falls on a sword or that lacks bread. So David really cursed the house of Joab. A vicious curse of his descendants. Let them be poor, let them fall in battle, or die of, you know, deadly diseases, leprosy or, or an issue. Uh, this terrible curse David places on the house of Joab. Now, Joab was strong, he was tough. And David was a little fearful of Joab. Uh, he needed him, uh, but he couldn't control him. Joab was his own man. At this point, however, 
David curses him, curses his house, and he evidently deposed him from being a general. In other words, he, he stripped him from his rank. Joab was no longer the leader over David's troops. However, when David, five years later, came to Jerusalem to establish that as the uh, center for the kingdom, David said, whatever man will go into the city and deliver the city shall be the general over my armies. And Joab was the guy who went in. There in Jerusalem, by the spring of Gihon, which was the water source for the city of Jerusalem. But the problem is that the spring of Gihon is in the valley. It cannot be defended. It's in the Kidron Valley. And when they built the city, they had to build it up on the hillside for, so that the hillside formed part of the defense. And then they would build the wall up on the hillside. But the problem was, this being your water supply, it is outside of the gate of the city so that it can be cut off by your enemies. And if your water supply is cut off, you can't last long. So the Jebusites had built their wall on the hillside above the spring of Gihon. Because it's not good to have the wall right in the bottom of the valley. It's not really a defense. You go up the side of the hill a bit, build a wall, and the hill itself forms part of your defense system. But they dug in to the solid rock from the spring of Gihon, and then they dug a shaft about 60 feet up through the rock, and the water would go from the spring of Gihon into this cave. And then from there, from the shaft, they could lift their buckets down. This narrow shaft, which is about, oh, a little bit, four feet wide or so. They'd lift their buckets down and get the water uh, from the pool at the bottom of the shaft that they had dug. Now, what Joab did, was go into the spring of Gihon, back some 70 feet or so, and then he climbed up this shaft and got into the city, got inside the city walls, and led, no doubt, a group of fellows in, and they, in turn, opened up the gates of, then of the city to let the rest of David's men in. Joab, by this bravery indeed, then became the general. Now, it was only recently that they have made available uh, the viewing of this shaft so that now in going to Jerusalem, going down the digs of Ophel, uh, it's quite fascinating. You can go down and you can stand at the top of the shaft that Joab climbed up and you realize what a tough, character this guy must have been, climbing up this dark shaft. And of course, he'd have to have some weapons, swords and all with him, because when you get to the top, you've got to do some damage. And uh, climbing up this shaft, it, it is, it, it, I mean, it's a real feat. I don't know that I would want to try it with a lot of lights and, uh, you know, just really strip for rock climbing. But this guy came up in the dark with a the sword and shield, no doubt, and, and up the, this shaft, and you'd have to just sort of, you know, climb up your spread eagle type and, and climb up this thing on and into the city. And it really is fascinating. Uh, of course, it's a confirmation of history. It's a confirmation of the Bible. As you stand there and look at it, and then you think of this uh, out of the scriptures there, it just becomes exciting, you know. Later on, when Hezekiah, 
knew that the Assyrians had sent out their army and they were headed towards Jerusalem. He had his engineers build a tunnel from this shaft, or from the spring of Gion, tunneled through 1,700 feet of rock and brought the water from the pool, uh, or from the spring of Guy home to the pool of Siloam inside of the city walls where again they would have their water supply inside of the walls. The same thing was done in uh, uh, Megiddo and by what king we don't know and the shaft isn't nearly that long. But um, it was a, uh, you can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel. We did it this last um, March when we were there. A group of guys wanted to go through Hezekiah's tunnel, a group of people actually. We had some gals with us. And um, so I made another trek. Uh, I've done it now about four times, and every time I do it, I say that's the last time. But, uh, you know, you see it once in what's left. It, but it's, it's fascinating to, to crawl through that tunnel and realize that this thing was, I mean, it's a marvelous uh, bit of engineering. They started at both ends and started coming towards each other. And of course they had to maintain the level so that the water would flow. Uh, you can see where they made some mistakes because one part of the tunnel, as you get towards the spring of Gihon, uh, the tunnel is quite high. Uh, in the middle of the tunnel, it's quite low. You've got to stoop to get through it. Uh, they weren't chipping out any more than they had to, and I don't blame them. That rock is solid. It's hard. And they didn't have, I'm sure, jackhammers in those days. And uh, you can see the little ledges where they had their candles and the torches. I mean, in that darkness in that, and in, in those conditions, digging that thing out was no doubt a tough task. But when you come out at the spring uh, of the pool of Siloam, the, it gets quite high, which means that they probably started out uh, too high to begin with and they had to then dig on down uh, to get the water level on down lower. But uh, it's there stands again and you read it in the scripture and it just stands as, as you know, uh, a testimony to the uh, truth of God's word. So Abner murdered or was murdered by Joab and David cursed Joab and absolved himself of the crime. And in verse 30 it says that Abishai, his brother, was confederate with Joab in killing of Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, Tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. So David did have some power and authority over Joab, but not enough. And King David also followed the bier. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice, and he wept at the grave of Abner. And all of the people joined him in weeping. And the king lamented over Abner. Uh, that is, he wrote this lament, and he said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Your feet, your hands were not bound, nor your feet put in fetters. But as a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. And all of the people wept again over him. And when all of the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was still day, David swore, saying, God do so to me and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun be down. So in order to show his real grief, he fasted until evening, and all the people took notice of it. It pleased them, and whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. David's popularity was growing. He was, uh, uh, that is in Judah, still not in Israel. It seems that the death of Abner uh, sort of caused an end uh, to the movement for the time being of making David king. It was five years before David was actually inaugurated king over all of Israel from this point. Uh, and Joab no doubt 
postponed or forestalled David's being inaugurated as king over all the land. But the people all understood that it was not in David's heart to get rid of Abner. And the king said to his servants, Know you not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, Joab and his uh, brother Abishai, they're too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. These guys are too tough for me. I can't handle them. But the Lord will take care of them. And that's a good thing to know. There are situations that are too tough for you to handle. You've got to just turn them over to the Lord. Lord, you take care of this. What a wise thing when you realize that, you know, your power is limited. To just commit the thing to the Lord. The Lord will have to take care of this. I can't handle it. The Lord will have to take care of this. Good lesson to learn. That lesson of commitment to the Lord. Let the Lord take care of these things. Now, when David was dying and was giving Solomon the charge over the kingdom, David said, Solomon, I want you to execute Joab. Get rid of him. You know, he, he caused me a lot of pain, a lot of problems. And so Joab was actually put to death by Solomon when Solomon took over the kingdom. Uh, Solomon had the strength and all at that time. And of course, Joab was an older man. Don't let his gray head go down to the grave in peace, you know. So David ordered his execution, which was carried out by Solomon. Now, with the death of Abner... When Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all of the Israelites were troubled. They really didn't know what to do at this point. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The one's name was Baana, and the other was Rechab. They were the sons of Rimmon, a Bethorite, and they were the children of Benjamin. And Jonathan, Saul's son, of course the one that was so bound and bonded together with David, he had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came that his dad was killed with his father in the battle of Jezreel. And so his nurse took him to flee and she dropped him and uh, he injured his leg. He became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Now these two sons, and that's just thrown in. I don't know why it's thrown in at that point, but just thrown in. We'll come back to that later. It's sort of a lot of loose ends, and then they start coming together. But these two sons of Rimmon, uh, Rechab and Baana, came unto the king, Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth, and they came into the house as though they were going to get some grain. However, the king was taking his siesta and he was in his bedchamber and they smote him, killed him, and then they beheaded him. And then they got out of there and ran all night through the plain and they came down to Hebron. And they said to David, Behold, here is the head of Ishbosheth the son of Saul, your enemy, which sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord the king this day of Saul and of his family. And David answered Rechab and Baana, his brother, the sons of Rimmon, and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of all adversity. I like that. The Lord has redeemed my soul out of all adversity. In other words, David had learned a very important lesson, and that was the commitment of his life to the Lord. Not to take things in his own hands. Oh, how I wish I could learn that lesson. I so often am trying to take things into my own hands. I'm trying to help the Lord out. Sure, the Lord wants to do it. Uh, but how can he do it unless I help him? 
And uh, I'm often guilty of just moving out on my own, doing what I feel is needed to be done, rather than committing it to the Lord and just leaving it in the Lord's hands. He's teaching me, I'm learning, but David had learned this lesson. The Lord who has redeemed me out of the hands of all men. I don't need man. I've got the Lord working. These guys thought that they were going to be rewarded by David. They thought that David was going to exalt them and maybe make them generals in his army or something because of this deed. But David said, When the young man came to me and told me of Saul's death, he thought that he was bringing me good tidings. But I took hold of him and killed him at Ziglag. He thought I was going to give him a reward, David said. He rewarded him, but not like he thought. But how much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed? Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take away both of you from the earth? And David commanded his young guards, armor, uh, his um, men, young men that were there, which were his bodyguards, and they killed them and cut off their hands and their feet and hanged them over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ithbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. So uh, it's sort of a bloody kind of a situation. Uh, these people were close to um, uh, nature and uh, <laughs> they were a tough crew to uh, reckon with. So all the tribes of Israel then came to David to Hebron, and they said, look, we're one. We're of your bone and of your flesh. The nation was more or less divided into the various tribes, and uh, the tribes made a pretty strict division. As long as they were divided into tribes, they were weak. Their strength lay in unification, and the unification under a singular leader. And so the representatives from the tribe now come to David. And this is some five years later, after the death of Ishbosheth. And they come to David and they say, Look, we're one body, we're, we're one flesh, we're, we all belong to the same family. And uh, in time past, when Saul was king, you were the one that led us out against the enemies. And you were the one that brought victory to us. And the Lord said to you that you should feed the people of Israel and you would be a captain over Israel. So all of the elders of Israel came to the king in Hebron and the king David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David the king over Israel. Now God had done it years ago, you remember, with Samuel. Samuel came down to the house of Jesse and anointed David the king. This was years earlier. It often takes man a long time to catch up with God. Sometimes we think God is lagging behind. He's so far ahead of us. And it takes us time to catch up with the plan and the purposes of God so often. And here, years later, man finally catches up with God. God had already anointed David the king, and now they anoint him as king over all of Israel. He was 30 years old when this happened. He was probably 18 or 19 years old when he killed Goliath. So some 11 years from his victory over Goliath uh, to be proclaimed king over all of the land. And he reigned for 40 years. So David lived to be about 70 years old. A hard life, though, he was pretty well decrepit by the time he was 70 years old. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months, and then he came to Jerusalem and reigned there for 30 and three years over all of Israel and Judah. So uh, 30 years old when he began to reign, reigned for 40 years. And the king and his men 
went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David. Now David came and he wanted to make the, the city of uh, the Jebusites, the city of Jerusalem, he wanted to make that the capital. But these Jebusites said, hey, we're going to put the blind and the lame as guards. You know, you have no chance against us, man. And, and they really put David down, uh, saying, you know, our blind and lame people can defend against you. And except you take away the blind and the lame, you're not going to come in hither. I mean, you know, they'll be guarding there, and you can't even wipe them out. So how do you think you're going to come in? Thinking that David could not come into the city. Then the city is probably one of the best defensed cities for ancient warfare that could exist. You have the deep Kidron Valley on the one side. You have the deep Valley of Gehenna on the other side. The only side that wasn't protected by a deep valley was the uh, northern side of Israel. And uh, so it was a city that could be easily walled and defensed against the enemies. And the Jebusites living there felt quite secure. And the children of Israel up to this point really weren't able to rout the Jebusites out of the city. And David said on that day, whosoever gets up to the gutter and smites the Jebusites. Whoever will climb up that shaft and smite the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be the chief and the captain. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort. Uh, Joab went up, they took the city, and David dwelt there in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from uh, Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. And of course, that's the secret of his greatness. And Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees, carpenters, and masons, and they built David a palace. And David perceived that the Lord had established him the king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Again, this shows uh, David was this mixed kind of a character. He had the bad side, but also he had this good side. And he recognized that it was the Lord that had done this. Uh, and not because the Lord loved David so much, but the Lord loved his people, and David saw that. The Lord did this for Israel's sake, not for David's sake. And he's not trying to take glory or credit for himself. Well, I'm so great that God's made me the king. But God loves his people. And he is giving them strength and power. And for their sake, he's exalted his kingdom for the people Israel's sake. And David took him, and again, this is the other side, the flip side. David's, he took more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron. And there were yet other sons and daughters born to David. And of course, this jumps way down now. It even picks up Solomon and some of the others, uh, which, of course, we haven't come that far in the story yet. But these are the names of some of those that were born to him in Jerusalem. Uh, Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibha, uh, Ibhar, and also Elishua, and Nepheg, and Japhia, and... Um, the other names, and who knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> now when the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over Israel, all of the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and he went down to the fortress. And the Philistines also came, and they spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now David's flip side again, the good side. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up? Against the Philistines, will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perizim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth on my enemies before me as a breach of waters, like a waters that come out of a dam. God's just, you know, float out against my enemies. And uh, wiped him out as with a flood. Therefore he called the name of the place Baal Perizim, which is the Lord of the Breach. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, 
God gave you victory once. Why pray? Let's go out and wipe them out. You know, that's the mistake we so often make. Because God did it this way once, we figure, well, God's established a pattern. <laughs> you know, we don't have to pray this time. It's just, you know, duplicate of the last. Let's just go out and take care of this, you know. And, and we can get in ruts so easily. You know, God does a thing one way, one time, and we think, well, this is the way God does it. And we form a denomination. <laughs> but God does it another way for someone else, and they form their denomination. In dealing with the blind, with some of the blind, he, he spit and made mud and put it in their eye and told them to go down and wash it off in the pool of Siloam. And the guy went down, washed it off, and he could see. Another time, Jesus just laid his eyes on the, hands on the guy's blind eyes, and they were open. Another time, the Lord just said, see, and the fellow could see. So you have three denominations now. <laughs> the mud in your eyes. <laughs> the he touched me, and he touched me not. But the truth of the matter is that God will not be limited to a pattern. God reserves the privilege of being free to work as He wants. And we should not be guilty of trying to formulate the pattern by which God works. Isn't it interesting how we always like to put things into formulas so that we can then have seminars and sell our formula of success. This is the way God did it, you know. Now I've got a program to sell. I've got the success program all worked out because I know how God works. This is the way He worked in my life. And, you know, you tell me something different, and brother, you're not a part of us, you know. Rather than recognizing that God can work in many different ways and does work in many different ways, now, David had the wisdom. When the second time the Philistines come up in the same valley, rather than just saying, okay, guys, you know, we know how to do it. We did it before. Let's do it again. He inquired of the Lord again. Verse 23, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, the Lord said, don't go up, but circle around behind them and come up over there near the mulberry trees and as your troops are waiting under the mulberry trees when they hear the sound of the rustling in the top of the leaves then is the time to strike now again this shows you the diversity of the way God works in similar situations, but he works in diverse ways. We read concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Now, there are diversities of gifts, and there are diversities of operations, but there's one Spirit. Again, you see, we can't confine God to one particular way. Even in the use of the gifts of the Spirit, or in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, there are different gifts, and there are different ways by which a same gift may operate in different different people's lives. And so this business of going around and searching for the formula for success is, is uh, just silly. Because God doesn't work by the same pattern every time He does His work. That is why in going out and holding ministers' conferences, which we have done quite a bit of of late and more planned for the future. We tell the ministers, look, realize first of all that God has a plan for your community. God loves the people in your community. God's interested in their salvation and God's interested in reaching them and God has a plan. I don't know what God's plan is for your community. 
I know God, how God worked in our community, but you can't just take and rubber stamp that in every community. I know how God worked here. But that could be totally useless to you. God has his plan for your community. Now, discover God's plan. Seek to find how and where the Spirit is moving and move with the Spirit. Rather than trying to formulate the plan and say, now God, here's our plan, bless our plan, which we are so prone to do. We lay out our whole program and then our whole prayer is, God bless our program. Well, it may not be His program at all. And so our prayer is really wasted. Because it's our program that we've devised. Now we're asking God to bless it, but it may not be of God at all. Learn what God wants to do. Discover the plan of God. Don't try and get God on your side. Get on God's side. It's a lot easier. Discover the will and the way of God and move with God rather than trying to get God to move with you. So God gave them a whole different battle plan. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he smote the Philistines from Geba until you come to Gaza. I mean, he really went down through and mowed them down. Brings us up to chapter 6, which we will get into next week as we will go for 6, 7, and 8 next Sunday. Shall we stand? Again, there will be no afterglow, so do hold up Jim Etheridge in your prayer, but especially hold up his little four-year-old boy who was taken, uh, he was, as I said, scheduled for uh, brain surgery tomorrow, but they had to take him, something evidently developed because they had to take him and rush him to the hospital tonight. So hold up uh, the family in your prayers. They, they need our prayers at this time. God bless you. And may the Lord guide you in his plan for your life. And may you learn as David to just commit your ways unto the Lord, knowing that the Lord will take care of things as you uh, just uh, submit your life, its facets unto him. And may God just continue to use you as his instrument in bringing his love to a needy world. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And The Lord make His face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee. God bless you. Give you a great week.